Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics, and in this video I like to discuss how just three weeks into Rishi Sunak's launch of election year, to fairly unimpressive fanfare, we're getting reports that even his own allies fear wipe out now. Not just that they will lose the election, but that they will be obliterated. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So I'm making a bit of a habit of discussing exactly where the Conservatives are going wrong. It's quite fun. But anyway, I had a comment on the channel asking why bother voting tactically when the election is a foregone conclusion? Uh, now, well, first of all, that sort of thinking can land you into dead trouble. Uh, but, you know, many a slip to its cup and lip, as they say. But it depends on what you see a general election as being. Right? There's a sense in which the overriding purpose is to determine the government. That is the thinking for the majority of voters, absolutely. And the government is largely binary, barring close results or hung parliaments. That's where it gets messy. But it is Parliament which is the sovereign power in the land when it chooses to exercise that power, not the government. It's just that the two are very, very closely linked. But let's be honest, I'm under no illusion that everyone voting Labour is desperate for a Labour government any more than all of those voting Conservatives want a Conservative government. Every election, there are a lot of people who vote for one of them to keep the other out. You know, the Conservatives attract a fair number of anti-Labour votes, which is why when Labour are suddenly more appealing, the Conservatives don't get as many of those votes. And Labour attract a lot of anti-Tory votes. And, well, in the current situation, they're going to attract a lot more. And if you're someone who votes against the Conservatives, whether tactically or otherwise, but you vote against the Conservatives, that's your overriding mindset when you go into the polling station, then surely seeing them beaten down to 50 seats is better than seeing them only beaten down to 150. And you know what's even better than seeing them beaten down to 50 seats? Five. You might say zero, but no, let them have five. Be extra humiliating to have five than none. And there are other benefits as well, especially for those in favour of serious electoral reform like myself, but I'm doing a dedicated series of videos on that as we lead up to the election. For now, I'll just point out that the Tories seem to be coming around to the idea that this may happen. There is increasing talk of Canada 1993, particularly in the last week. It's now getting mentioned a lot. There's probably a lot of Conservative MPs didn't know what happened in Canada 1993. I'm getting the impression they sort of do now. When the Conservative government lost all but two of its seats as it lost votes on both flanks. Well, the Conservatives in this country face the same problem. For the first time, in modern times at least, you know, you could argue, well, UKIP and the Brexit party were a challenge to them in 2015 and 2019 respectively, but not like this. In both of those years, Labour were less focused on winning over key voters. So they weren't feeling that squeeze on both their flanks. Right now, Labour are ruthlessly efficient with how they are engaging target voters. Also in 2019, the Brexit party stood down in existing Conservative seats anyway. You know, with their new form, Reform UK, insisting that they will stand this time, and it being more believable now, the Conservatives, for the first time in any of their political careers, are facing a serious squeeze of their vote in both the centre and the far right. I have never known anything like this, and neither have they. It is going to be, if anything, even more interesting than 2019 in terms of political upheaval. Bloomberg published an article this weekend in which they claim even Sunak's allies are fearing the potential for wipeout. So this will absolutely be being discussed with Sunak himself. My speculation is that the Tories believed their own nonsense about midterm blues because that was always the excuse. Oh, it's midterm blues, all standard, you know. Yeah, they're just giving the, gov the party of government a punch in the nose. They'll be fine come the election without ever doing a deep dive on the polling. Now, this may or may not be what happened, but it's been clear that the Tories have been steering a course to losing the election for some time. And whatever the reason, it shows that Tory advisers and Sunak's allies simply haven't bothered to understand the situation if they're only now realising what's happening. But I suspect my speculation is not far off the mark. After all, why would they just come to this realisation now? Because it's election year the time when oppositions who go on to lose the election start to lose their poll lead. But Labour's poll lead is going nowhere. In fact, right now it's actually increasing, but that may be a blip caused by the intense infighting over the Rwanda bill over the last few weeks. 
that there is no sign that Labour are going to be substantially losing their poll lead now. This, I think, has forced these Tories to face up to the fact that their assumptions have been untrue. I think they weren't just saying it to the public. I think they sort of believed it themselves and now realising, yeah, that's wrong. Isaac Levado, the Tories' you know, election strategy, chief election strategist, he's tearing his hair out telling Tory MPs that they cannot hope to put up a strong challenge unless they unite behind Sunak. And he's right. If Tory MPs were prepared to replace their leader one last time before the election, last week was the opportunity to bring him down. They didn't. It's clear that the vast majority of MPs understand that changing leader again is only going to make things worse. So if they want to put up a fight, it's obvious they've already committed to keeping Sonak. They need to unite behind him, even if they now realise that he's a political idiot. The fear for Tory strategists is that the publicly increasingly see the Conservatives as having given up. You know, voters get the impression that the Conservatives have given up. Well, why would they support them? Why would you support a party that's not even trying? May as well stay at home or vote for someone else with a bit more ambition. And yet, how do they avoid this perception? Because over half of all the current Tory MPs are likely to lose their seats, and it could be much more. They're not going to give it their all for a lost cause and worry about what to do for employment afterwards. So they're looking for alternative work now. And this does not go unnoticed by the media. You know, Levado has tried to urge Tory MPs to run a disciplined campaign with a focus on an improving economic outlook. The economic outlook, as far as voters can feel it in their pockets, is not improving, at least not for enough of their important voters, it will be for some. Also, if in a few weeks' time it is announced that we're in technical recession, that is going to be a setback and a half. And the economic news out for December so far, though not conclusive, is not looking good for Sunak. I mean, this, this is not all of Sunak's making, of course. The Conservatives in general failed to grasp the electoral position they found themselves in after 2019. The 2019 election was completely mad for a number of reasons. But when the dust settled, the Conservatives found themselves with a coalition of mutually exclusive demands. I've talked about this right from after those election results came out because the Conservatives have lost ground in their traditional marginals, but won the, what we call the Red Wall. They gave themselves a monumental challenge for the following election. They hailed it as ripping up the rule book, new form of politics. No, no, it was not. <laughs> this is because the Red Wall were attracted to promises of levelling up. They wanted investment and they're not that asked about taxes as long as they have decent jobs and public services. But the traditional Tory stomping grounds already have good incomes and they don't want to pay to help other parts of the country essentially catch up to them. For these, what you might call blue wall voters, it was like paying taxes, which they already don't like, in order to make themselves less affluent in relative terms. Why on earth would they do that? So if the Tories wanted to maintain this fractious coalition of voters for the following election, they needed to deliver in a way that satisfied both or they needed to decide to drop one of them. You know, they could have, for example, dropped the red wall, said, right, you know, we, we had use out of you. Thanks very much. You go back to voting Labour if that's what you want to do. And focused on their traditional support to become a more traditional Conservative Party again. They had to do one of those two things. It would have been extremely challenging for an, even a very focused government to manage that. Unfortunately for the Conservatives, what they had was a Boris Johnson government. Yes, Sunak takes his share of the blame as Chancellor as well. It's not like he was conscious of this challenge either. But the point is that the Tories collectively made no effort to square this circle before Sunak became Prime Minister. This has been a problem years in the making. And now they're screwed. Completely screwed. It's too late. It's not even like they've picked a side, like I said. There was no investment in public services or better jobs, so the Tories annoyed the Red Wall. But they still put up taxes, so they annoyed the Blue Wall as well. The Sunday Times today described Sunak as boxed in from left and right, you know, and it was known this was going to happen in 2020. But instead of coming up with a plan to be able to fight on both of their flanks, they sim simply didn't do anything about either. In fact, the Rwanda plan, I've said this before, the Rwanda plan magnified one of their problems. In 2020 and 2021, Reform UK were scratching around for a platform. 
they were farting about on like 2% vote share. They were basically on par with UKIP. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't segue into the old anti-vax thing because they're not anti-vax. You know, so there was no culture war for them to latch onto. Then the Tories came up with their Mad Rwanda plan, drawing attention to small boat crossings in the channel. The oxygen of publicity. And before you knew it, Reform UK had their opportunity. It was the culture war they were waiting for. Now they're polling on an average of about 10% across the same polls. Sunak should have dropped it when he became Prime Minister. Instead, he kept pouring petrol onto the fire, thinking it was water. Where Reform UK are concerned, the Tories are the architects of their own downfall. It would be a shame not to take full advantage and crush them utterly at the election, wouldn't it? So yes, the Tories really are facing wipeout. I don't follow Canadian politics closely, but the surface conditions are certainly very similar to their 1993 election this year in the UK. And now, even those close to Sunak seem to be starting to see it. On Friday, I did a video where I asked if the Tories really understand how much trouble they're in. Their behaviour suggests not. But it seems that some at least are finally cottoning on to, to realising that this thing about midterm blues cannot be used to hide behind in election year. And I wonder how they're going to react as this fear of a wipeout begins to dawn on them. Because it's one thing to think you're going to lose. There's a lot of people believe that the Tories are essentially, they've accepted they're going to lose and they're salting the earth for Labour. And to an extent, I absolutely see that happening, yes. But the purpose is to stymie Labour so that they can then mount a challenge to come back. So prevent Labour doing anything appreciable, come back after a single term in opposition. But what happens if they now see themselves facing down the barrel of effective obliteration at the polls? What if they're not even the official opposition after the election? They're sat behind the Lib Dems. All of this is possible. And some are starting to see it. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time. I'll see you later.